Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. As this week's reading in the Come Follow Me is Matthew chapter 13, along with Luke 8 and Luke 13. Where I'm headed with this is there's going to be a heavy uh, focus on using parables to teach one single theme. A lot of different parables, too. The focus is going to be on the gathering process and that we teach in a way that converts our students and, and helps convert us, further convert us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matthew 13 plots out the major steps and the elements in the gathering process. And as Christ does that, I love just kind of the introduction. I know it's not the first part of Matthew 13, but what he teaches about parables. Verse 13, Therefore I speak unto them in parables, these little stories, because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. They're telling, they're getting these nice little cute stories, and they're not quite getting the whole meaning behind it. And then verse 14. And in them is fulfilling the prophecy of Esaias, Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their eyes dull of hearing. I'm oh, sorry, ears dull of hearing, eyes they've closed. At least by any time, they should. And then I, I just see this little formula the Savior gives. You see with your eyes, you hear with your ears, and then you understand with your heart. It, it's a whole immersed process. Eyes, hearing, but really conversion is more than just hearing the Word of God. It's more than kind of seeing the effects of what the gospel does but it's an understanding in your heart which allows the Spirit to touch you. And I, the Lord just says that. You see, you hear, you understand, and should be converted. That gospel speaking to our, our minds and our hearts leads to conversion. And when we are converted, that is, as Christ promised, I should heal them. I love that. I mean, and that's where we're headed today. So, as we talk about the parables, we're going to have a major theme, but in a way that is taught to be able to be converted to the gospel, to understand Christ's gospel, to understand the gathering process, and further allow Christ to heal us. Elder Christofferson, D. Cobb Christofferson taught, For conversion, you should care more about the amount of time you spend in the scriptures than about the amount you read in that time. I see you sometimes reading a few verses stopping to ponder them, carefully reading the verses again, and as you think about what they mean, praying for understanding, asking questions in your mind, waiting for spiritual impressions, and writing down the impressions and insights that come so you can remember and learn more. Studying in this way, you may not read a lot of chapters or verses in half an hour, but you will be giving place in your heart for the Word of God, and He will be speaking to you. Plead with God in the name of Christ to write the gospel in your mind, that you may have understanding in your heart, that you may love to do His will. Pursue this blessing diligently and patiently, and you will receive it. And I just love that thought. So here's an imagery, and, and I will just start off just this the idea of, of a parable with pictures like these. And if you want to, you can pause the little video. What do you see in the picture? Well, if it's helpful, I'll, oops, I'll go back and tell you. You can see the owl right here in the middle. And then I'll just pause. What analogy can you make from this picture? And I'll have students just come up with analogies of, of owls and hiding and whatever it is. And I'm just like, this is great. Okay, now we'll try another one. What do you see in this picture? And what analogy can you make? Okay, and they'll see, I see the leaves, then someone, pretty quick, they'll see this, this little critter. I don't know what the scientific name is. Critter is my name. And then this picture, what do you see? Once again, yes, they see the owl. Or the little camouflaged lizard here. And really the idea is you see, or you can hear these things, but do you get the analogy? Verse 13, once again, I speak to them in parables. And they can see these pictures in their minds, 
but it's not just the hearing and the seeing kind of the picture, but it's understanding with the heart what Christ is trying to do. So we start with chapter 13. Christ goes out of the house and sits by the Sea of Galilee, the seashore. And he is going to teach a series of parables with one theme. The theme in Matthew 13, the theme that is taught so well, is the gathering process. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, I shall proceed to make some remarks from the sayings of the Savior recorded in the 13th chapter of his gospel according to St. Matthew, which in my mind afforded as a clear and an understanding upon the important subject of the gathering as any recorded in the Bible. I know each of these parables have different layers and different levels. You can take each parable on its own. But for today, in this video, I'm going to focus on what Prophet Joseph Smith talked about in the theme of gathering. So here's the parables. I'm just going to go quickly through them before we kind of talk about them in any detail. Here are the parables in Matthew 13. First, you get the parable of the sower, sowing the weeds, or sorry, sowing the seeds in different types of soils. You have the parable of the wheat and tares growing up together. You have the parable of a mustard seed. Then you have the parable of three scoops or leaven or uh, what do you call, boy, not baking soda, but yeast. So parable about yeast. And then you have a parable that, that Christ tells about hidden treasures. And then you get the parable of the pearl of great price. The gathering processes continue to be taught as a fish are caught in a net. And then you have a parable about new and old. And then it's, what is this? So for me, I will, and this is just kind of a teaching idea. My plan is to talk about the sower together as a class. It's a little bit longer. And dive into what it means and then just say, how does this relate to the gathering process? Gathering people into the faith of the fold of Christ. And then I'll sign out these others into groups. And here, here it is, wheat and tares, mustard seed. And I'm going to say, will you just, number one, learn about this parable? What does it mean? And then the next, probably, uh, next instruction would be, okay, everybody have a meeting. Now I want you to relate it to the gathering. And then I'll have somebody from each group just say, okay, teach us what you, what, what you learned. What is the parable? And how does it relate to the gathering? And just starting off with the sower. And, and, and the prophet Joseph Smith, you know, this affords us as understanding as important a subject on the gathering. And I know this is the sowing, but this is the start of the seed of faith being sown. And the seeds fall into four different places. It falls onto a path. It falls onto stony ground. You know, a little bit of thorny ground and good soil. Jared Halverson in 2008, wrote just, I, I really liked his article, just explains, hey, here is the type of seeds, here's the type of soils it represents, you got the wayside, okay, you got the paths, the stony places, like a rock, there's, there's not much moisture there, among thorns, and the good ground, and then he explains, here's the result, and it's this grid form, and for me, I love the grid forms, you get the wayside, you know, it's on this path, and that's really picked good pickings for birds to come just eat it up. The stony places, well, it springs up, not a lot of moisture there, not a lot of that they can get, so it comes up and then the heat comes and it withers. Among the thorns, it grows up, but there's so many thorns and weeds that it chokes them out. Hey, this is like our gardens, right? If we're not paying attention, those weeds just overtake our, our gardens. And the good ground brought forth fruit. And I love the analogy, hundredfold, 60-fold, 30-fold. It's different depending on that good ground, but it's all good ground. Okay? And it springs up and increases. And there's an explanation for each one. The wayside. You know, those are people who hear the Word of God, but don't quite understand. And then those birds are symbolic of the wicked one that comes and just takes away that seed of faith that could have been so good. But before it's really even had a chance to germinate, it's taken up. You have the stony places. You know, that's where there's not much earth. And there's no depth to when their seed is planted and germinates, but they don't give it enough nourishment, don't give it enough water to be able to get a deepened root. So maybe they get a little tribulation. 
and 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 they they walk away. They're they're offended. Maybe they're persecuted a little bit, or offended. Okay, maybe there's a little bit of affliction, and they immediately kind of walk away, or just there's some temptation and they fall away. This is just one that just lack that constant carrying that rain or moisture. The ones that are among thorns. Okay, the explanation of that. You get in Matthew 13, 22, Mark 4, 19, and Luke 8, 14. And all, that's why I like about Brother Halverson's little explanation is he gets all these cross-references in there. We're teaching it all kind of as one. They they just they start off and, and the soil is just starts off good and they, they have this good, good uh, tree growing up and their faith is starting and then the cares of the world comes along. They just want other things. They want the pleasures of life and they allow that to choke out their their good word of faith. The good ground, they hear. I'm going to say they see as well. They understand and they endure. And that plant continues to be nourished and grow. Okay. And, and you know, Luke 8, 15, I, I add that. They bring forth fruit with patience. And sometimes it just takes patience. You, you know, the worst thing you can do is you have a plant and you want to see how it's progressing. Well, you dig it up to check on the roots, how, how deep they are. Well, that's not going to do very good. Be patient. Let the roots grow. Let the plant grow. And it's interesting to note how the seed is characterized. The seed that's falling by the wayside is a good seed. It's God's seed in Luke 8, 5. It's the word of God. The, the seed that's in stony places, it's good. The seed that's among thorns, it's good. The seed in good ground, it's good. The word of God's always good. No matter how it germinates in someone's heart, the seed doesn't change. Just uh, whether we allow it to germinate and develop and grow. So, you know, the wayside doesn't get a plant. The stony place, plant comes up a little bit, withers. The plant among the thorn is alive, but it's not fruitful because it doesn't have any opportunity to grow enough to mature enough to bring forth fruit, or in Luke 8, 14, Luke to perfection. And then the good with the good ground, the plant produces fruit, springs up, and the fruit increases. It blossoms more and more. Satan's strategy is simple, and it's, it's in each one of these what Satan does to make sure the seed doesn't become a big plant. So with the wayside, Satan's strategy, keep people from obtaining the Word of God. Keep them from understanding it, hearing it, seeing it, understanding it in the heart. That just keep them from believing any way you can. With the stony places, Satan's strategy, restrict knowledge and testimony. Rob them of desire. Keep them from gaining their own testimony. Keep them from the living water. Attack them with tribulation, persecution, affliction, and temptations. So among the thorns, Satan's strategy among those. Okay, realize I can't kill the plant. So I can focus on it not being fruitful. So that's the focus. Direct the strength of the soil away from being fruitful to other things. Distraction is that tactic. Okay, keep it away from developing and maturing. Okay, and with Satan's strategy, with the good fruit, you're gonna, he's going to try and keep them from enduring, keeping them from being patient, attacking their honesty, their goodness. He's going to try and encourage pride or complicity. Um, he's going to stifle the testimony until the word is lost somehow. He's going to try them to be imp in impatient. So that's the strategy you kind of see in, in the parable. And then from Brother Halvertson, if you want to help people who have the seed planted on the wayside, you teach them the word. You make it simple and understandable. You help them. Okay? For those who are where the, the, the seed of faith is planted, maybe in some stony places, there's not a lot of water there. You just got to help them get their own testimony. You're trying to give them just a little bit of that spiritual moisture. Help them to increase their desire so they can get a little bigger roots, so they can spread out a little bit. You give them the life-giving water of Jesus Christ and help them to have a desire for that. Okay, with ones among thorns, you help them focus on God instead of the worldly things that are distracting and taking away the moisture, the pleasures of the world, the riches, the pride, whatever it is. And for those people on good ground, 
um, I was at my bishop's house there at night, and he says, "This is my, the the chapel. I don't know what do you, what do you call it? The chapel group or something. The people who, you know, you look up any Sunday, you know, they're there. They're they're having the faith on on just solid ground. And you know, they're sick sometimes, or they're gone a little bit. But you, if you how to help them, you just continually encourage them to grow. Continually tell them, don't be complacent. Just keep that spiritual growth happening." Now, wheat and tares. I don't know if you've ever seen wheat and tares grow up, because for me it's kind of like there's wheat and there's like fake wheat. Here's a picture of a wheat on the left-hand side and a tare. When their plants are young, they're almost identical. You can, you can identify the difference between two of them, and you can take out the tares, but the danger is you have to be very careful because when you the tares will want to go really close to the wheat, and you have the danger of pulling both up. It is a lot easier. I think the parable is 100% right. You wait until they're mature, and it's really easy to separate the wheat from the tares. And maybe that's a little bit of the gathering process, the gospel process. God's going to encourage everybody to gather and help all mature, wanting us to be like wheat, having that production. And later at one time, it's a parable of the gathering that one day there will be a separation, and Christ will do that. Now, there's also the parable of the mustard seed. And this is a few years ago. I bought a box of mustard seeds just online. I've used it now for like 10 years. I still have enough for probably another 10 years. When we get the mustard seed, I give each student a mustard seed and a piece of tape. And I go, okay. And I encourage them, tape it in your scriptures. Or if we have, we have scripture journals, tape it in your scripture journals. This time, I'm, my classes now have like computers. I don't know that I'm going to encourage them to tape, tape it on their computer, but I'm going to say, I want you to tape this somewhere where you won't lose it. And then go home tonight and tape it somewhere where you'll know this is a mustard seed and it grows much, much bigger than the seed. Though the mustard seed is very small, it can grow into a tree where birds can dwell and protection find protection in its branches. When the church was restored in 1830, it was like a tiny mustard seed. Since then, it's grown until its branches are found in almost every nation on earth, and its members find, the, find in them a spiritual home and protection from the world. The Savior used the parable of the mustard seed to teach that his church would grow from a small beginning into a very large organization. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed and trees. Mustard seeds are tiny, and the full-grown mustard tree grows to a small you know, 10 to 15 feet maximum. But the seeds and plants are renowned in ancient days for their quickness in germinating and taking root, and taking over space, and growing in unlikely environments and conditions. Though useful, they are treated like weeds and are unwanted, but by then, they're almost impossible to get rid of. And also, this is probably my favorite picture of a mustard tree. Yeah, you can see it's about 15 feet high, and it's in the most unlikely conditions and thriving so, and then we make the comparison to the church. Then, 1830, with six members, and how it's grown to today so much. Next parable, and we're going to compare this to the gathering, is a parable of leaven. For the leaven, there were three measures of leaven. And, and I love the way the prophet Joe Smith compared this to the gathering process. The parable of the three measures of leaven means, according to the prophet Joe Smith, it may be understood that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has taken its rise from a little leaven that was put into three witnesses. Behold, how much this is like the parable. It is fast leavening the lump and will soon leaven the whole. I love that effect of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. How they just added their little testimonies in, spiritual of the Book of Mormon. I know we have the witnesses of the eight as well, and just helped the church rise in spirituality and have their faith strengthened in Jesus Christ through the Book of Mormon. And I just bring out, you know, these three three men, their tremendous effect on us as a church. And I love just the note from Elder Neil A. Maxwell. In the last days, happily, the church will grow extensively with its membership being scattered upon all the face of the earth. Nevertheless, its dominions will still be comparatively small because of wickedness which will close the ears of many to the gospel message. And that's one of the reasons why I love the idea of the mustard tree. Yeah, it goes from really, really small beginnings, and it gets big, but it's not the redwood. 
it, it, it's very, very much like the growth of the church. Um, and then we have the hidden treasure in Matthew 13, verse 44. And a lot of times I have this one, in, and, and I think it's appropriate. It, it's compared to that, the treasure is the gospel. And what will you give to you know, sell all to get this treasure and to get the gospel treasure? And we, we do great uh, stories of some of the early members of the church, you know, handcart pioneers who they give up their all, and you can see it as they make their, their way to Zion. They give up their all in, in their quest. So we all know the parable of treasure in the field. The farmer who goes out and finds a treasure and sells all that he has and buys the field in order to claim the treasure. One interpretation of that story is that we're all the farmer and the gospel as the treasure. That's a good way to read it. But what if the Savior is the farmer and we are the treasure? What if he was out in the ministry and found you and sold all that he had gave everything in his possession to embrace the treasure, the best thing in his life, you. I'm not sure we think of each other that way. I'm not sure we think of employees that way. I'm not sure we think of anybody that way enough, spouses or children or grandchildren or friends or neighbors. Well, we should. You got the parable of, of the pearl of great price, which incidentally, when they're in Britain, the early apostles, and they have some of these great just um, revelations that, that they want to share. And people are like, this is so awesome. I want a copy. They put it together, and that publication is called The Pearl of Great Price. That's how we get the name, because people want it. And uh, kind of, isn't that a great name for The Pearl of Great Price? You also get the fish in the net as a gathering process. I mainly, fate, I mainly fish with a pole. Okay, a little bit of bait, spinners, done it on the ocean, done it in the streams, done it in lakes. You know, I've read and I've watched people fish with nets. And my observation is when people fish with nets, it's kind of like this picture. They get a lot of the same fish because they're, they're running in schools of fish. But they also get fish of every kind. And I just love that imagery of the church. The church gathers of every kind. Yeah, maybe there is there is some uh, commonality that the fish who are gathered have been receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ, have been able to learn how to recognize the Spirit and act on it. But those who are gathering with the church are just so diverse. And then you get the parable of the new and the old. And for me, one of my analogies is you have the new covenant, the New Testament, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, or the Old, you talk about the Bible and the New, Revelations with the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, a Book of Mormon. Parables like all of these are a call to investigate the truth, to learn more, to inquire into spiritual realities, which through them are but dimly viewed. They teach arithmetic to those who have the capacity to learn calculus in due time. They are the mild milk of the world of the word that prepares our spiritual digestive process to feast upon the doctrinal meat of the kingdom. Matthew 13, when I teach it, I focus on the gathering because of what the prophet Joseph Smith said. And I tie individual parables in that common theme. And we have a discussion on the gathering process and what we've learned about how God is gathering us in the last days. Matthew 13 gives us as clear as understanding upon the important subject of the gathering as any recorded in the Bible. That includes the parable of the sower, the wheat and tares, the mustard seed, leaven, hidden treasure, pearl of great price, fish in the net, and the new and old. So my teaching thought is, as I'm teaching this in my classes, I, I'll talk, we'll talk the first about the, the sower parable and talk about how do we interpret parables and teach them, okay, look for meaning and cross-references. Then I'm going to give them individual parables, have them learn about that, and then focus on the gathering. And I'll probably do it with a quote from President Nelson. President Nelson recently said, The gathering of Israel is the most important thing taking place on the earth today. Nothing else compares in magnitude. Nothing else compares in importance. Nothing else compares in majesty. And then I'll just say, okay, 
what did you learn about the gathering from Matthew 13? And what can we see with our eyes and hear with our ears and understand with our hearts? What do we learn today that will help us be converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ and may heal one of us today? Thanks for spending a few time with me, a little bit of time with me as we talked about mainly, I know, the gathering process and the parables in Matthew 13 with you know a little bit of addition of Luke 8 and 13. Hope you have a lovely day. Keep smiling.